Welcome, everybody, to uh, the Microsoft Research Summit, the um, Responsible AI Track, and right now the panel entitled Content Moderation Beyond the Ban, Reducing Borderline Toxic, Misleading, and Low-Quality Content. Um, my name is Charlton Gillespie. I'm a uh, senior principal researcher at Microsoft Research in the New England Lab. Uh, and I've co-organized this panel with Zoe Darmé. Zoe Darmé is currently um, at Google as a, I wrote this down, as a senior manager in public policy and global affairs handling search. Uh, and I want to tell you a bit about the panel and what we're going to talk about today, and then I'll introduce our three speakers. Hopefully we'll have a chance to uh, hear from them and then also uh, open up a discussion. Uh, let me start by saying that um, we're thinking about content moderation here, and it's been important and amazing to see that content moderation has grown as a public discussion. We pay more attention to it. It's sometimes on the front page of the newspaper. It's a discussion in legislative corners and academic corners, and this is phenomenal. But one thing that Zoe and I were noticing and, and wanted to talk with some experts about is that we tend to focus um, very exclusively on the question of removal. So the removal of content, things that get deleted, and the removal of users, people who get banned. Uh, and this is an important part of what social media platforms do, but it's not the only thing. In fact, uh, uh, we think there is a whole set of tactics and techniques that platforms often use when they're trying to deal with misinformation, harassment, threats of violence, terrorism, pornography, and you name it, uh, that don't uh, look like removal uh, and suspension. And then, in fact, uh, this array of tactics are quite important and perhaps growing in importance. So the idea of this panel is to sort of dedicate some time to think about those tactics, bring them up in the forefront, and, and really try to bring an interdisciplinary lens to what are these tactics, how do they work, what are their implications, um, how effective might they be, what kind of problems do they raise, and how do we go forward um, thinking about content moderation in a way that includes these tactics and recognizes their growing importance. Uh, so Eric Goldman uh, wrote an excellent paper called Content Moderation Remedies, and he was making a similar point that if we set aside the question of removal, there's a whole set of other tactics that platforms have been using for quite a long time, not just theoretical, but uh, are in practice. Let me give you a few examples. This is not an exhaustive list, and more may come up as we're talking about it. Um, but think back to when we were debating whether uh, Twitter and other platforms should be putting fact-checked messages or warnings on uh, President Trump's tweets, other political figures. The idea of putting a fact check or a warning is a tactic that doesn't remove the tweet necessarily, but uh, changes where it's going to go and how people understand it. Uh, YouTube has been playing around with nudging commenters who might be writing something that uh, could be harassing or could be violent, saying, are you sure you want to post this comment um, in order to sort of keep discussion respectful? Doesn't prevent someone from doing it, but maybe it's going to nudge or change uh, the tendency to do so. Uh, Reddit as a platform has been playing around with a technique called quarantining, where whole areas, whole subreddits on topics that have indicated that they uh, are, are tend to be places full of misinformation or, or, or violence um, can be sort of set aside. They still exist, but the posts they write won't show up on the front page. There's a warning before you enter them and there are limits on how they can uh, earn money. Uh, we've seen growing efforts to reduce the visibility of misinformation. We're seeing a lot of platforms doing that. That can mean um, taking certain kinds of borderline content and uh, removing it from recommendations, recommending it less, leaving it out of search results, so that they're still there, but they don't circulate quite as widely. Uh, we're seeing this especially around the pandemic and vaccine misinformation, but not exclusively. Uh, Instagram uh, recently introduced a sensitive content control, letting users decide how much and how racy the content they would see would show up in their recommendations. And those settings were based on the idea that uh, you might want to see more of it, you might want to see less of it, and you could sort of um, adjust that. And other platforms are playing with kind of design techniques to give users different ways to calibrate uh, that content. And recently, uh, uh, very recently, in the Wall Street Journal, we've had res revelations about uh, Facebook and a program they called XCheck that was setting aside many users who were public figures, um, um, uh, people who might be sort of like PR issues, people who had prominent followings, to handle them differently, right? Uh, to handle them uh, in a different process. So sort of whole shadow structures of processes that might not look like your traditional kind of, uh, do you take it down, do you remove the user?
Um, and we think that these tactics are um, growing in prominence and are under attended to because we tend to discuss the things that look like censorship, because we worry the most about content that's removed or content people that are kicked off, um, because that triggers a whole lot of questions about free speech and journalism and bias and politics. Um, uh, and they're also extremely hard to study. Uh, it's hard to know when these uh, tactics are being introduced. It's hard to know how much a video has been reduced or how far a tweet would have gone otherwise. Um, and so these are very difficult things for us to consider and things for us to, uh, to research. So the idea of this panel, again, is to look beyond the ban, to think about these tactics as a category um, across many platforms, some that have been in place for a long time, some that are showing up uh, um, quite recently. Why do these tactics matter? How do they work? Um, what are the different ways of thinking about the logics behind them and the whole sort of moderation ecosystem? Uh, and what are the implications of these approaches for the platforms, for the users, for possible regulation, and for the future of online discourse? Okay, so that's a quick introduction, but I'm sure that uh, you'll learn more about those uh, types as we begin to discuss how we should think about them. Um, so let me introduce the rest of our panel. So we're going to hear first from Charlotte Wilner. Charlotte Wilner is uh, the director of the Trust and Safety Professional Association after having spent many years uh, working first for Facebook and then for Pinterest. Um, then we'll hear from Ryan Kahlo. Ryan Kahlo is a professor uh, in the School of Law at the University of Washington. Uh, and then finally, we'll hear from Sarita uh, Schoenebeck, who is an associate professor in the School of Information uh, at the University of Michigan. And then we'll have some Q&A from Zoe and myself and uh, see what we can figure out. I want to highlight the fact that we very deliberately wanted to get some, uh, some very different perspectives here, an industry perspective, a legal perspective, a design perspective, a sociological perspective. These problems require this kind of questioning, uh, and they touch on all these issues. Okay, so uh, so let's start with Charlotte. Um, thank you so much for being here. So we know that content moderation is a messy uh, project uh, for platforms large and small doing all sorts of kind of things. These tactics, these um, uh, reduction tactics and filtering tactics and labeling tactics, the ones that go beyond removal, um, are they as messy? Are they a solution to the mess? How are you thinking about them and how do you think platforms are thinking about them? Absolutely. Um, first, I would say uh, in the words of Marie Kondo, I love mess. Uh, and I think that to, to be in content moderation, in a way, you got to love mess because the reality is life is messy, right? Humans are messy. And so there is no one clear answer on the question of content moderation where it's like, ah, this is the, the unmessy way to do it. Um, you're always going to be thinking about trade-offs. And a lot of the way we, we think about our work is in terms of trade-offs. If there were one right answer that everyone could do, everyone would be doing it, right? Instead, what you're often trying to do is, is think through, okay, we have a few, sometimes all you have is bad choices, but usually you have a few sort of mediocre choices and you're going to have to figure out what are the outcomes that we're probably going to see here and are we willing to accept those outcomes? Are we going to get to a better place sort of pursuing those? So even thinking through the, the list of things that, that you had sort of introduced us with, these tactics, um, I think it could be useful to talk about, you know, in the, in the seat of a content moderator, how are you thinking about the tools that you have in your toolkit? And I think first and foremost, in content moderation, mostly what we want to do is prevent problems to begin with. Uh, and so that's where when you look at tools like the be respectful nudges, right? When YouTube's like, hey, you know, remember, be, be respectful when you're talking to people. Uh, Twitter has this feature that I run into all the time where you go to retweet something. It's like, do you want to read the article first? Um, you know, on Nextdoor, if you post anything about COVID, like where you, can you get a COVID test? There's a little pop-up thing like, remember, a lot of misinformation on there about COVID. Are you sure you want to post this? Be thinking about how you're communicating with your community. And the idea with all of those is to help a, help a user moderate themselves. And that's a choice that takes, you know, takes obviously some burden operationally off of your team, but it allows people to be in charge of their own content. It allows people to make choices about, you know, the, the way they represent themselves online. And that in a lot of ways is our ideal in a content moderation world. Um, you might also be looking at, you know, sort of these, these medium, sort of medium level decisions for content where you're trying to get a faster resolution for a user. So often when people think about content moderation, they're like, ah, yes, content moderation. Someone reports it and then someone looks at it and it's up or it's down, right? And even if that were all the content moderation we were talking about, you're waiting, right? That user is waiting for an answer on their report. The person who's had their content reported is waiting for a decision on whether their content is going to exist or not. And so 
a lot of those, you know, sort of uh, in sort of intermediate decisions that we're talking about today are ways to help either, you know, the reporting user or, you know, the, the accused user or the public sort of on your platform at large feel some sense of more immediate resolution, even if it's mm -hmm. temporary. So those are things you might see, like when you report something, it gets hidden. Maybe it gets hidden for you. Maybe it gets hidden for everybody until someone reviews it, right? And there's sort of a, a set of levers you can pull there as a, as a content moderator. Um, the fact checks, the quarantines, right? Those are often, you know, not necessarily doing a lot. They're not removing the content, but they're showing your community, hey, we're on it, right? We've noticed, we've heard what you're telling us, and we are, you know, monitoring the situation. Here's what you need to know. And so having that visible accountability is a content moderation choice that is not, it's up or it's down. And again, I think helps the community often feel like they've got some sense of control or they're being listened to or they have, you know, the ability to participate in that process. Um, you know, you do a lot of things like uh, you're focused on de-emphasizing disruptive content. You know, you had mentioned low quality content. I think we all have a debate about like what constitutes low quality. Um, but you see this with spam, right? One of the things that in general has been very uncontroversial in our world is, you know, either deleting spam or often sort of quarantining or demoting spam. And a lot of people, most people, maybe not spammers, but most people really like that. That's a good choice, even though that is often a little imprecise. It's often not that transparent to the end user because we're able to determine through a series of metrics we may discuss a little bit later, we're able to determine that that's low quality content. Um, I think increasingly what we're seeing is platforms really thinking through what it means to recommend content. And that's something I hope we can talk a lot about with yeah. Sarita and Ryan um, with you, because I think historically recommendations, I think are viewed as like, oh, this is like content that performs well. And so we're gonna be pushing this out. Cause it's like, ah, yeah, this is like, you know, you're gonna get really a lot of engagement or whatever it is. Um, I know certainly when I was working at Pinterest, I was at Pinterest from 2013 to um, the end of 2020, we thought a lot about recommendations because we sort of felt like, well, recommendations means we think this is great and are recommending it to you, right? There's the sense of agency. And so, um, you know, that's that's really an interesting lever for folks to pull when they're like, okay, it's not just that it's up or it's down. It's like, do we think it's good and you should have more of it, right? Um, there's a lot of a interesting sort of de decisions to be made along that spectrum that increasingly content moderation teams are part of either in labeling that data we're actually making some of those decisions um, and then finally and then we'll really get into it um i think there is there is a really important role for these intermediate solutions when you just don't know the answer uh, and that is extremely common for a lot of things um, and you need you need to make a decision, right? Content moderators don't have an option to just say, well, I don't know, therefore nothing happens, right? Even doing nothing with a piece of content is making a choice. Mm -hmm. And an example I'd give here is actually a lot of the different types of decisions we're seeing on Ivermectin. Um, so it's, you know, S September of 2021 and different platforms are making a lot of different choices. And Ivermectin is the substance where a lot of folks are trying to use it to treat COVID-19. That may not be the best medical decision. Some platforms have gone right out and said, nope, no ivermectin anywhere. We ban all of it. Ivermectin is a real medical substance, right? It's a real pharmaceutical. It's used in veterinary context. It's used in human context. It's one of the, the only treatments we have for river blindness. So some platforms are saying, well, you know, maybe we don't ban it overall, but we have to. I, apparently there's a platform where it's asking you to uh, upload a picture of you and your horse. I don't know, right? There are all these decisions that people have to make on the up or down where there really are these real world consequences. And so I think, you know, in, in situations where the information is changing fast or the information is something we just can't know, that's where this intermediate road becomes really interesting. Mm -hmm. Ryan, um, thank you for being here. So, I, so we can hear this like, the way that these techniques might sort of intervene at the right moment, they might sort of uh, involve themselves a different way. I, I've heard you write about incentives, thinking about content moderation as a kind of incentive process. How did these tactics, not the removal, but these other ones, how do they work as incentives? Do they work as incentives? How do we think about that? Sure. Well, um, so I, I, I am one of the co-PIs at a center here at the University of Washington called the Center for an Informed Public. And what we do is we study and try to come up with techniques to resist misinformation. Mm -hmm. um, and we span multiple different disciplines. Mm 
So I'm writing this essay with my my colleagues, um, Emma Spiro and Kate Starbird and Jevin West um, and Chris Coward, mm -hmm. in which we're drawing a few distinctions um, about misinformation that I think will be instructive here. Um, and the first is simply the distinction between misinformation and disinformation, where misinformation refers to just kind of getting something wrong, um, just innocently, maybe, maybe not. But the idea is you're just saying something incorrect. I've done that myself. Many people have done that, right? Disinformation is, uh, pardon the, the pun um, about an, about the about horses, but a horse of a different color because you know it, it's actually a strategic campaign, right? That has both um, elements of misinformation, elements of of lies and and falsities and misleading statements, um, but it also has as part of the whole campaign a lot of truth and a lot of opinion. And why does that matter from an intervention perspective? Well, because, you know, if you think about the themes of sort of responsible artificial intelligence, I mean, there may be things that machine learning can do about individual pieces of content. So, for example, an AI system may be able to figure out the context in which mentioning this drug is OK and the one over here when it's not and when it's going to be misleading. Um, but AI is not going to be terribly good at figuring out what might be part of an involved disinformation campaign, right? And there's all kinds of examples like that. The, the more you dig into the motivations of the speaker, um, the, 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 the um, more you will change how you might want to address it. And it's true of misinformation, but it's also been true in the past of things like hate speech, right? I mean... There's a lot of people out there who are hateful people who are dedicated to it. They're white supremacists. Nothing you're going to do short of banning them is going to work, right? Mm -hmm. There are other people who are teens who are trying to transgress and get a thrill. And if you just remind them, hey, we're paying a little bit of attention, they cease entirely, mm -hmm. right? And so this is not a, a one-size-fits-all environment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and what works is often a product of the motivations and the identity of the speaker. Um, the last thing I'll say is that at that same center, we've worked on um, some computational modeling techniques. I should say this is not my own work. Um, it's Joe Buck Coleman and, and colleagues mm -hmm. modeling um, what the interventions do on Twitter. And one of the takeaways from that paper, which um, you know it's, it's an excellent paper, I would look it up, um, is that often it takes actually multiple different uh, interventions in order to damp down uh, the, 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 the proliferation of misinformation on an ecosystem. So I also think we need to be talking a little bit about when it's not just one thing, not only, does, not only is one size fit not fit all, but often you're talking about two or three different interventions on top of one another. Yeah. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Sarita, we, we wanted to bring you into this conversation because of the way your work has been thinking about how, how the users are treated by these um, interventions and how they could be. And we've heard sort of why these tactics might make sense for the platforms that are in a tough situation, trying to intervene in, in sort of moving targets and, and why um, from a kind of like, here's a harm we might want to like in, invest in, you know, reducing it. And this is not a simple thing. What, how, if we approach this and think about users and think about an ethics of care, um, how do these tactics look from your perspective? Yeah, and, and uh, Ryan's comment around digging into kind of the motivations of the speaker um, is a really nice segue. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of expand on that. Um, a couple of days ago, I went to this panel called Then and Now, 50 Years After Attica. And it was a panel of people who had expertise in uh, incarceration and prison systems, and they were reflecting on kind of, you know, the past 50 years of, of prison systems. Um, and I feel like we can learn a lot from judicial and, and kind of carceral systems in the U.S., but it's not really like happy lessons. So it's kind of, you look at those systems and we've spent, you know, decades or centuries trying to create safe and whole communities, but we still struggle to do that. And I think it's pretty similar online. So we have these online governance systems, but they, it's not clear they're in kind of users and communities best interests a lot of the time. And so, I, you know, I would say that they're overly punitive, um, which is this banning content ban users. And I'm not, I think it's okay. Like punishment is okay. So I'm not opposed to that. Um, sometimes that's what you need. But the problem is that those, those responses don't kind of allow opportunities for accountability, 
or a correction or repair. So, you know, Ryan gave the example of, say, the teenager maybe post something that they shouldn't have on Instagram. Or you might have a mom of a baby who posts a naked picture of the baby on Facebook and it gets removed. And then you also have, you know, Donald Trump or whoever inciting violent behaviors on Twitter. And right now you kind of have the same set of responses and trajectories for all those cases, even though just, they're dramatically different and they should be met with different responses. So, um, so this, you know, the one size fits all argument I'd really agree with. And I, I think a focus on user behavior instead of, or at least on top of a focus on just moderating content would um, help a lot. So you kind of move away from like this whack-a-mole governance towards ideas about accountability, repairing harms. And, you know, not everyone will do that, of course. Um, sometimes, like I said, just ban them, punish them, it's okay. Um, but when people make mistakes, I think we could do more to encourage better behavior, whether it's saying, hey, here's why you made the mistake, which is seem very obvious. Even our judicial systems offline say, here's what you did, and here's your sentencing. And, and you don't really get that. You don't, most people don't know why, why they were why the content was removed or why someone else's was or wasn't. Um, and then, so you, you may educate them, provide more transparency. Um, and then maybe even sometimes ideas like apologies or communication or mediation in some context where there's maybe some community norms and some commitment to those communities could help have other pathways beyond just going straight to banning the content, removing the content or banning the users. Should we ask a couple of questions? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, please. Have you got one to start? I do. Um, so I think one of the things that I'd like to know from you all is whether you think we have enough information on these different tactics that aren't just going straight to the punitive me measures that Sarita mentioned. So we are kind of, as an industry, experimenting. Um, but do we know whether these things actually work? Um, we'll have seen, you know, Instagram tried hiding likes um, as an experiment. They were fairly open that it wasn't very clear whether that was having an effect or not. Um, it, should we still experiment as an industry with things like that, even if we're not sure that they're effective? I can go first with that. I think the answer is yes, but to Sarita's point earlier, I think we need to understand what what success what what we mean by success, right? Um, I think one of the challenges in a lot of these decisions is folks are often a little unclear on okay, well, what what's the end goal here, right? Is the end goal a reduction of offline harm? That's a little difficult to measure. Is it a reduction of number of user reports? Well, that's an easier one to measure, but there's all kinds of other ways you can influence that, right? So I think, it, you know, even starting out with that, you have to decide, you know, sort of based on your values as a, as a company and your values within the product, you know, what is it you're actually trying to achieve? But then, yes, I think there has to be room for experimentation because we're not going to know. I think we, the important thing is that we are transparent about that experimentation. Mm -hmm. Ryan, can you point to some that in your studies or the research that you've seen that some of these techniques you think have demonstrated some effectiveness, the, the kind of effectiveness it's always asking about? Or is it still kind of a, an, an ongoing object of study? Oh, oh, sure. I mean, you know, um, there, there have been in, for example, the European hate speech context, there have been, I wouldn't necessarily say um, experiments per, per se, but what I would say is that if there are organizations out there that are trying to reduce the amount of hate speech in Europe, right? And so to, to, to assess their efficacy, um, to show, to show that, that, um, that they're making a change, they will keep, you know, some pretty good records of, of what happens. And there was one experiment that involved, um, this was in sort of a, a much, a much less sort of channeled, a much less algorithmically sort of driven ecosystem, but one in which there were just these chat rooms and people would, or comments and people would make comments on a particular platform. Um, and they made an arrangement wherein um, they would uh, get the ISP or get the host to send a note. And the content of the note would just say, look, here's what you said. And when, and, and, and when you said that, uh, that's in violation not only of the terms of service of this community but also you know law because in some cases in europe things are uh, illegal we we don't we're not going to have that lever here in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh being able to police content 
Um, largely, you have, you have to be doing something rather egregious and transgressive for, for it not to be visible to the First Amendment. Um, and they found enormous rates of success where there was not repeat offenses, right? And so I think you have, um, I think that you have uh, the, the possibility that, that companies will do their own testing, A-B testing and other testing. Um, I agree with Charlotte, it needs to be deeply transparent. I'm especially worried about something Tarleton alluded to earlier, which is the idea that um, you're you're subtly modulating people's reach. Um, and I think there's already a sense among a lot of users that um, they're they're um, you know, it's almost like having a good or a bad hair day. I don't I don't have either of those anymore. But I mean, it's like having a good or a bad hair day. One day, you, all of a sudden, something you say on Twitter that you think is going to be reaching everybody goes nowhere. Another day, some random thing you say, go, and you start to wonder, is this about the content is about or is there something going on in the, in the background? And I think that leads to a sense of distrust and unease that is not healthy. So I think that transparency is critically important. We also, of course, saw um, Facebook get sanctioned for some of its work on emotional responses to different kinds of content because it wasn't it wasn't above the table. It, it felt it just felt odd to people. Um, and the other thing, thing I think is critically, critically important here, and this is a legal point, is that we need to protect the people that are either blowing whistles or whistleblowers within the company or the people that are doing external um, uh, accountability research, right, to determine whether or not a stated intervention is actually effective. And one of the things that really concerns me and others in the community is the idea that a company would, for example, weaponize their, their terms of service through something like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and go around suing people who are trying to determine whether or not there's bad content on the site. And I think that the law should be crystal clear that if you're doing accountability research to look for bias, look for toxic content, look for missing, look, look for validation that a company is doing what it says it's doing, yeah. you know, that really should be off limits for, for, um, uh, for, for civil sanction. Um, and so, you know, yes, I, I, I do think experimentation is, is critical, but it should be transparent and um, it shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't be reined in or policed by the company themselves. Yeah. Let, let me pick up uh, on what Ryan was just saying, because, you know, when we started out, there, there seems to be a real appeal to some of these techniques, right? There's a kind of flexibility in them that's responsive to the kind of problems that we know are sort of always moving. Um, there's a, a gentleness to them, right, that avoids the kind of the, the, end, the end of the speech altogether when it's removed. Um, but, but Ryan raised one real concern here, which is that it's uh, that especially because we're trying out these techniques, they can be uh, not so public. And, uh, you know, it leaves users in the place that Ryan was describing where they may not know why things are happening. And that breeds a lot of suspicion. So let me push that further and kind of say, like, not only are some of these techniques, um, you could, you could imagine platforms not being public about them, but they're awfully hard to be transparent about, right? So let, let's take two examples, because some of them are quite visible, right? You put a, a fact check on a tweet, or you, you put an age barrier on a content, you can at least see it's, it's happened. The fingerprints of the intervention are, are there um, for the user who's involved, for, for a, a, a researcher. But let's take two. So one is um, reducing something through recommendations, this is an example that uh, both Charlotte and I mentioned, uh, it's taking some borderline content and just saying, this is not going to travel as far. You can still get to it, but it, maybe it's, you know, it's the, the, the bad tweet day that Ryan was talking about. It just doesn't go anywhere, right? Um, it's, it's hard to know how far it should have gone. So how do you understand that it's happened and how do you be transparent about what was done? Because the idea that that video or that post didn't go very far compared to what? And then let's ask a second one, which is a different kind of question. Sarita is talking about, uh, you're talking about kind of um, maybe stepping towards much more sort of uh, involved interventions, taking situations where there could be some restorative justice, there could be steps taken, those are time intensive, they happen very specifically, and they're private too, right? If some platform is trying to help you and I resolve attention, that isn't something that they can exactly sort of like list as something they're doing. So so how do we deal with these kind of um, uh, deeper problems of transparency where it's not clear you can be, or we haven't at least invented a way to do it? How do we deal with that kind of problem? Yeah, it would be nice to have a set of criteria that one is evaluating on. And so, you know, you imagine what are the outcomes or the dependent variables, call it what you want. So, you know, Ryan mentioned, do they do it again? Like classic 
recidivism measure, you know, um, there could be deterrence of other people. Do other people see some set of things happen and decide to behave differently? You know, there's been studies of that on Reddit. But you could also imagine other kinds of community values, like does someone who experiences harm, harassment, whatever, do they come back or do they leave the community? Like that's a pretty good measure of did whatever you do make them feel safe or comfortable coming back? And that's measurable. It's much more measurable on, online than offline. Um, I think the second thing would be centering you know, human rights or civil rights in any of these kinds of experiments or techniques. I'm thinking of um, a nice paper by Brandeis Marshall on algorithmic misogynoir, which is basically algorithmic, a kind of um, anti-black misogyny, it's the Moira Bailey's concept. And she was saying, you know, there's shadow banning and, and these things, and a number of people pointed out the the experience of being shadow banned, or certainly the perception, but it's really hard to know on TikTok and things like that. Um, and so I think centering the values we care about, you know, around bias, around race and gender, in evaluating any of these. So it's not just do people recidivate or do they come back, but it's who's doing that. And from a civil rights perspective, you might focus especially on, you know, our groups that are maybe already harmed in whatever context being further harmed by this, then that's even if overall it looks good, if those groups are being further harmed, then this is not probably the right step. Charlotte? I, I think that's exactly right. And I think, you know, the point, especially about focusing not just on, you know, offender behavior, uh, but focusing on, you know, the either the, the follow-up behavior of the people who felt, um, you know, wronged or were wronged in that scenario, or in general, you know, people who maybe have never, you know, filed a report or made a complaint, but mm -hmm. you're able to understand that they might have had a bad experience and understanding sort of going forward, you know, what what does that look like for their experience with your product? I mean, I think the the product I was or the the point I was going to come out with originally was just you know an observation that, you know, Charlton, to your point earlier, it can be very difficult to know exactly what's happening. Um, and you know, I think that's like an easy thing to say, well, yeah, obviously these systems are complex, but you know, certainly something I have observed universally in my time in, in tech, you know, with, with any size of company, but especially when you are, you know, small to medium and you are moving, you're moving fast and all these things are happening. Employees are going in and out. Engineers are going in and out. You know, every, all different experiments are running. You're running a hundred experiments at the same time, and that's not to say like, and that's the way it should always be. And it's okay if we never know what's happening. But it really is incredibly difficult to know often exactly what part of the system is affecting which outcome. Um, you know, and even you know going into like, well, what ha does someone ever come? Who, who turns out of the system? Right. You know, okay, they might turn out of the system because they had a bad experience. And certainly I've had teams where that's exactly what we've looked at. We've said, oh, you know, this person reported a piece of content or they, you know, ha had to block someone. Did they, you know, did they churn out? And the data, no matter sort of how we positioned it over years, was always super unclear because people, you know, leave services for all kinds of reasons. And so I think all of all of those things are really important sort of angles to be analyzing. Mm -hmm. And we also are going to have to be okay with, like, maybe we're not going to know sometimes. Maybe we're not going to know a lot of the times. And that's where it comes back to, I think a lot of the, the companies need to be examining, like, what are our values here and what are the effects we are trying to have? Mm -hmm. And that's where I think society should be really brought in and be partnering as well, right? As it's not just also about what platforms want. It's about, you know, what is good for us as a human society. And I think that's where those perspectives have to come in it's just difficult because this is a world where we really try as much as possible to operate on data. And ironically, there's a lot of data out there. It's just not maybe readable. And that's, that's one of the, I think really hard for, certainly for me, one of the hard truths of the field. Yeah. I, I just want to add a quick point, if I may, yeah. um, Zoe and Tarleton, uh, you know, I, I think um, sometimes, sometimes this sort of thing boils down really just picking up on something Charlotte said to, to political will, right? I mean, so for example, if if the way to address um, disinformation campaigns from abroad is less about, you know, um, this or that particular warning or throttling or shadow banning, whatever happens to be, um, 
than uh, than and more about you know state statecraft and economic sanctions and so on it, it really takes the government to intervene in that instance right and if we and if we really expect a lot of of companies um, and we want them to operate in an environment where they they can't do the thing that they're doing unless they're able to get a handle on the toxicity in the environment again these are these are somewhat matters of political will so I think we need to focus not just on the fact that there's a bunch of tools we should use them all we should think about who they're appropriate for we also once we figure that toolkit out, we need the political will to, to force people actually to deploy it in practice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Ryan, I have a follow-up question for you, I guess. What do you think is the role of government here in terms of the tactics that we're talking about? Because already they're looking to legislate industry in terms of what we do, what our practices are, what our processes are, how transparent we are about setting policies and enforcing them but they haven't really gotten to this um, second order of action, which is demotion, which is interstitials, which is warning screens and all these types of things. Do you think there is a role for government to have oversight there or, or, or is that um, perhaps a step too far? I, I want to be clear that I'm just, you know, speaking idiosyncratically I'm, about my own views. Um, but what I, what I will do is I'll invoke a second distinction we think about a lot at the center which is the distinction between speech and action or inaction. And the law should not pick winners and losers in terms of speech. And the law should not treat platforms like as though they were the speakers. And I don't think we should actually do a lot about that law that says that platforms shouldn't be viewed as the speakers. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't um, ensure accountability in other ways. So for example, in the context of cybersecurity, we expect adequate security. And although there do exist standards for security and best practices, it's not like the government sits down and says you have to do X, Y, and Z and D, right? But rather, you're going to be held accountable if given your scale, you don't have adequate security. And there too, the, the perpetrators, the problem makers are not the companies per se, it's somebody else who's coming into the ecosystem um, and, and causing harm. Um, and we, yet we expect our tech uh, platforms to be resilient against that, right? So I think we need to move to a place where there's accountability without picking winners and losers in speech and without treating platforms as though they are the speaker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there seems to be a real tension between the need for the platforms that actually have the levers to have some flexibility in responding to things that change, like security, um, the desire for some kind of consistency and accountability and then uh, a sort of regulatory framework that can both like impose those expectations and leave some room for that kind of experimentation so those techniques can grow as well. Um, that's, a, that's, a tricky, that's a tricky balance. Um, I'm noticing that we have about two minutes left. And so what I was hoping to do was finish with a quick fire round. This is Research Summit. And so one of the things I wanna highlight is that um, there's a lot we don't know here, right? This is uh, platforms reaching in new territories, the law reaching in new territories, uh, communities reaching in new territories. And, and we can tell that like, this is a widely uh, used set of techniques if we draw a big circle around them. So I wonder if each of you would take sort of max 30 seconds and say, what do you think is the next thing that you wish we knew from a research perspective that we don't know yet? Like if, if we're gonna include this as part of the big picture of the content moderation ecosystem, and you could send off uh, a researcher, <laughs> right? To, to like answer a question, what do you think is the next thing that we need to to, to think about or that we'd love to answer that you don't think we have an answer to. If I call someone first, you're like the first person who has to jump in. Can... And if you can make a horse reference, that'd be great. Cause we seem to have a horse theme. <laughs> I, I was going to jump in until you asked for horses, but Serena? um, yeah, I'll, I'll, oh, outside of the horses. The horses. I, um, <laughs> so one thing that from the perspective of kind of justice and accountability frameworks, I would love to have not just one, but like a team, a cabal of like fantastic students from various places around the world, countries, languages around the world, where the harms, um, shame, the justice theories, what what their online experiences look like and what would be restorative for them could be better understood and centered beyond kind of the Silicon Valley ideas of free speech and, and um, you know, what we center in the U.S. Awesome. Charlotte, the first quick answer. To say, yeah, yeah. That, for me, it would be understanding 
what interventions work best for the user and also work best for the moderator. Moderators are in general uh, the least well paid um, and have the least power in the overall ecosystem when it comes to who is employed by all of these companies. And they do some of the hardest work. And so under having a better scientific understanding of the impact that this work has on them and their lives would be top for me. Yeah. Thank you for that, Ryan. Last thought. Oh. I'll just quickly say, you know, I'd really like to understand what reasonableness looks like in this context. You know, as a torts professor, I spend two or three days with my students on what's reasonable behavior. What should we really expect in these different? And I think this that we're very far from from knowing um, what constitutes not just best practice, or but what is a, a like a reasonable way to address this. And I think what, once we get that, um, we'll we'll have a better sense of what standards should be applied. That's great. Thank you. Those are excellent questions. I'm really glad I got to hear from all of you. Uh, we have to close. Thank you so much, Sarita, Charlotte, Ryan, uh, Zoe, of course, and uh, and to Microsoft Research for hosting. Um, thanks. I look forward to talking to you more about this in the near, near future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.